I'm JG Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments, you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. This edition of Parallax Views is brought to you by the $10 and above tier supporters of Parallax Views on Patreon. So, with that in mind, producers credit shoutouts to Gunner, Mark, Alexander, Catherine, Tilo, Emilia, Jeff, John, Bert, Brian, Elliot, Michael, Brace, Nick, Galen, Arlen, Bo, Gigadelic Media, Chance, Chase, Dan, David, Gary, Ishtofer, James, Martin, Matthew Ho, Brian, Nobody, Thomas, and Dano. And now on to the show. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. On this edition of the program, Yale University Professor of Law and History, Samuel Moyne, joins us to discuss his fascinating and important new book, Liberalism Against Itself, Cold War Intellectuals and the Making of Our Times. In said book, Samuel critiques Cold War liberals like Isaiah Berlin, Gertrude Himmelfarb, Lionel Trilling, and Karl Popper, among others, arguing that they helped pave the way for the current neoliberal order and the withering of the welfare state. He makes the case that these thinkers, in various ways, betrayed the progressive and enlightenment ideals of the liberal tradition and that their legacies haunt us today, in a moment where liberalism arguably finds itself in crisis. We'll be discussing all of that and much more in the conversation to follow, so without further ado, let's get right to it with Samuel Moyne, author of Liberalism Against Itself, Cold War Intellectuals, and the Making of Our Times. Welcome to Parallax Views, a guest that I'm very excited to have on. I've read some of his uh, previous works, including the book Humane, which was about uh, drone warfare and issues of that nature. And he has a new book out uh, called Liberalism Against Itself, Cold War Intellectuals and the Making of Our Times. And I love this book already. I I just finished reading it earlier today, but I was in love with it even before I picked it up because I saw that it had a... uh, very nasty review written by Jonathan Chait. And if Jonathan Chait doesn't like it, that means I will probably love it. Uh, so I'm happy to uh, say that I really enjoyed the book. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for already backing me in that fight. <laughs> so uh, maybe a good place to start is with defining what you mean by Cold War liberalism, because you're very specific about that. You're talking about Cold War liberalism. What do we mean when we talk about Cold War liberalism as opposed to, you know, liberalism more broadly? Well, it, 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 the main idea of the book is that liberalism changed in its kind of spirit sometime in the middle of the 20th century. You know, it started before the Cold War kind of was on in 1946 and seven, a lot of people were already trending in the direction of what came to be called Cold War liberalism with the collapse of the Weimar Republic in Germany and aspects of World War II 
um, drove others and in this direction. But the Cold War really crystallized things. And the basic idea of the book is that liberalism had been emancipatory before. And in the middle of the 20th century, liberals gave up on emancipation in part because the Soviet Union was claiming to advance it as a worldwide project and liberals retreated and they began to see the state as primarily a source of danger than opportunity and history less as a forum of opportunity for making free and equal human beings as and more as like an alibi for those who want to kill a lot of people. And so I regret that this happened because it, I think the long run consequences have been unfortunate because we need that emancipatory liberalism that, you know, existed in part before the Cold War came. Now, real quick, because I, I know people are going to be saying this in their head if they haven't read the book. Yep. You're not arguing that we need to go back to some uh, previous pristine version of liberalism no. because you, you're critical of uh, past forms of liberalism and, you know, things like the relationship between sort of uh, Anglo-centric liberalism and racism. So you're not saying right. that we have to go back in time. You're saying we sort no. of have to forge a new liberalism. No, I, exactly. I mean, I do think that the, you know, there are resources in older forms of liberalism that are going to be very useful just because there's sort of a mix of good and bad in the past. Exactly. There it's always true. And there are some good things in cold war liberalism. So it's more like, how do we create a future creed that kind of capitalizes on the good and rejects the bad in our experience. And that's true of our experience both before and during cold war liberalism's reign. If you could, could you speak a little bit to how this book came together? Because I know at the beginning, and I I know for sure at the end, you talk a little bit about 2016, the election of Trump, and the arrival of this little book that came out uh, called Why Liberalism Filled by Patrick Deneen. And Deneen is very much on the conservative end of things, uh, to put it mildly. But that book uh, caught a lot of people's attention. And uh, I know that in a way, your book is sort of playing off some of the ideas in his book, but you sort of make the case exactly that his most persuasive argument is the argument against Cold War liberalism. That's right. And neoliberalism, which we can talk about later, but which I think followed naturally from Cold War liberalism. So, you know, Patrick Deneen, you know, scored a huge success in part because of the accident that his book came out just as Donald Trump was uh, becoming you know, U.S. president so unexpectedly to most people. And in part because Deneen's claim was so outrageous that, you know, Trump's election could kind of be seen as a verdict on the whole modern age and, you know, not just American carnage, but the carnage that liberalism, you know, inflicts. I think he got tons of attention, including mine. Um Now, the truth is, I'd always wanted to write about these Cold War liberals, but I thought, what if I could argue that it isn't so much modernity or liberalism in general that failed as a particular set of mistakes that were made in the history of liberalism relatively recently? And so that would allow us, in a sense, to feel that the situation was a little more salvageable We wouldn't have to go back to the Middle Ages to set things right. Not that the Middle Ages are worth reviving, Um, but we we would would see like in a more discriminating way, like what what the resources in liberalism are before junking it and then diagnosing exactly what's to blame for our situation, which I think turns out not to be liberalism generally, but Cold War liberalism and its successors. It's interesting, too, because, you know, throughout the book, I think you get this impression that Cold War liberalism uh, has its own sort of contradictions. Uh, You know, for instance, uh, sort of critiquing the Enlightenment and then blaming figures like Rousseau for the terrors that come with, you know, Hitler and Stalin, uh, while claiming that, you know, oh, our sort of liberalism is uh, 
uh, anti-teleological, but they're sort of making a teleological argument connecting Rousseau to all the terrors that came in the 20th century. Absolutely. What's kind of funny in, in a way is that the Cold War liberals were generally critics of teleology, especially the idea of historical inevitability, because they said, well, that's what the Soviets say that, you know, they they're the, going to be the last regime standing at the end of history. And we just have to, like, get there or even speed up the process. And so liberals said, no, history is very kind of contingent and there's moral responsibility, which in the midst of it, which could make, you know, history go one way rather than another. And yet when they come to thinking about how the Soviet Union emerged, they blame it on all of these old sources as if those sources like the Enlightenment or the thought of Jean-Jacques Rousseau or the French Revolution or the thought of GWF Hegel or Karl Marx just were kind of like lighting a fuse that inevitably, you know, caused the bomb of totalitarianism to explode in the 20th century. Why why did they make that connection, these figures like, for instance, Karl Popper or Isaiah Berlin? What, what's the connection they're drawing between the Enlightenment and, uh, you know, what, you know, Hannah Arendt is called the sort of totalitarian state? Well, I mean, the basic reason is I think they were they they were hurt by uh, the shocking rise of tyranny in the middle of the 20th century. And they set out to look for scapegoats uh, and then they made some dubious moves like it's just true that the soviet union claimed to be the heir of the enlightenment and the french revolution and marx uh but of course those themselves were very debatable claims and yet instead of rejecting them and in a sense trying to own those sources and say liberalism stands for the enlightenment or the you know, it, it the French Revolution unleashed the liberal project or, you know, liberalism has a lot to learn from Marx uh, in creating a just economy. They repudiated it all. And I think the consequences for liberalism were unfortunate. I think it's very interesting, too. And we'll get into some of the specific figures you cover. But first, one aspect of this that I find very interesting is the way in which these Cold War liberals, even though they wouldn't necessarily define themselves as conservatives, they end up, I think, in my view, adopting a very conservative view of human nature, which is to say an absolutely sort of pessimistic and uh, fatalistic one. You know, that sort of fatalistic view of, you know, man has fallen and there's nothing that can really be done about it. Could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, that's pretty central to the book, actually, because I think it's true in general that liberalism trended conservative over the 20th century. We think of these two things as distinctive and opposite. But of course, we know that there can be relatively more conservative liberals like Jonathan Shade, uh, who in a sense push liberalism uh, so that it approximates uh, what's allegedly its enemy. Um I think the Cold War liberals did that because essentially they hated the Soviets so much that they kind of became kind of more friendly with uh, the conservatives that had been their old enemy. Um, And I try to illustrate this by showing not just how liberals give up on kind of all the old sources that the Soviets were now claiming from the Enlightenment to Rousseau and the French Revolution and Hegel and Marx, but also they found new sources that were emphasizing, as you say, the kind of, you know, evil and fallenness of human nature. And I show that they did this in religious form, choosing With, a more uh, Lord August. Aston, right. Right. They choose them in general. I mean, they choose a more Augustinian Christianity that kind of emphasizes original sin rather than our ability to transcend our, you know, our, our sinful proclivities. And then in secular form, they go big on psychoanalysis and in a version that emphasizes this aggressive drive that the later Freud, the later Sigmund Freud insisted is in, you know, is, is kind of at war with love and kind of driving our actions. 
Yeah, the Freudian element becomes very clear, especially in the chapter on Lionel Trilling, where, you know, the focus for Trilling seems to be on, you know, how can the liberal subject uh, regulate themselves and their worst impulses without the interference of the state? Yeah, that's right. So Trilling, as an American literary critic who taught at Columbia University, where I used to teach, and he was really one of the most famous intellectuals of his time, Um and he, his significance in the book is that he was a former leftist who um, adopts psychoanalysis in this very kind of grim depiction of the way people are. And for him, the political consequences are a liberalism that is not yet officially conservative, but is that but is oriented towards the repudiation of radicalism as likely masking human aggression it's it's going to be um a kind of you know um like mystification of the way we really are which is you know aggressive and hateful to one another and if we don't accept that then liberalism doesn't have a chance it's very interesting because it's all sort of tied to this cold war liberal foreclosing on the future You know, and it reminds me of, uh, you know, Francis Fukuyama saying, you know, it's the end of history. You know, there are no more pages left to turn in this story. Right. I mean, at least Fukuyama is operating with the idea that there was a historical script. It's just that he thinks that um, that script has already concluded. Um, And of course, he thinks it's concluded in something like Cold War liberalism and neoliberalism. Um, and yeah, he's so, still a Hegelian at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, so he he in a sense calls the game early, and we're very familiar with that kind of figure in the history of ideas. It's called right wing Hegelianism. The older Hegel himself said, "Look, history is done," um, and yet, yeah, like the 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 appeal of Hegelianism for many liberals long into the 20th century was to say liberals are in the vanguard of a bright future for humanity in which they have to be made free and equal since they're not there yet. And it's this optimism and expectation that the Cold War liberals give up. One of the characters who I think sort of guides the entire book and also, I think, comes off the most sympathetically is uh, Judas uh, Schlar, who wrote After Utopia. Could you talk about why you uh, decided to sort of use her as the focus of a lot of the book and the importance of that book after Utopia? Well, you know, Schlar is probably one of the least known of the characters in the book, Um she died in 1992, so she was a pretty young person at the beginning of the Cold War, and yet she wrote what's probably the most famous distillation of Cold War liberalism in 1989, just three years before she died in the year the Cold War began to end. It was an essay called The Liberalism of Fear, and I think in that essay she kind of epitomizes what Cold War liberalism meant starting in the 1930s and 40s. Um, And yet, I show that when she was a young person in the 50s, she looked kind of with horror on Cold War liberalism, precisely on the grounds that it was abandoning what liberalism had meant before and its optimism. So in a sense, she made my argument Uh, before me and before she changed her mind about what liberalism ought to be taken to mean. So I give her kind of a place of honor in the book. What for you is her most important uh, insight that she offers when approaching the subject of Cold War liberalism? Well, for my money, and, you know, it's really the reason she's in the first chapter, she says that you know, the Enlightenment has to be seen as the kind of, you know, the big bang for uh, emancipation. And therefore, any liberal has to kind of embrace an emancipatory project that the the call for 
uh, of a, a free society of equal citizens um, is the kind of legacy of the Enlightenment that matters most. And no liberal can kind of turn his back or her back on that commitment. Um, and I just think that if that's true, then we're the main liberal question is where do we stand in relation to the achievement of a free society of equal citizens? And I think, you know, to me, the obvious answer is, you know, part way there and therefore liberalism needs to be about kind of doing the job better and completing the journey, or at least heading down the emancipatory path more than it has, you know, in recent decades. Can you speak a little bit to like concrete ways in which this sort of pre Cold War liberalism uh, was different than, you know, the liberalism being expounded by people like Berlin and Popper and how they how this sort of liberalism uh, promoted an emancipatory state? Like what were the right. concrete ways in which it did that? Right. Well, so first is just the goal. I mean, most liberals today would say that liberalism is not about emancipation or, you know, free agency um, and kind of institutions that bring them about. They would say liberals um, stand for the proposition that everyone needs to get along uh, as if the highest goal were social peace, not freedom and justice. Um, and then I think, you know, the 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 first liberals in the 19th century, people like um, Constant Mill, Tocqueville, these are you know people who are still read in political theory classes. They w insisted that liberalism was not just about freeing people, but freeing them to be creative in their lives uh, and. Uh, I have a whole chapter actually on the idea that um, romanticism, uh, which is this, you know, big revolution, which, you know, leads, you know, really everyone in the world now to seek, you know, novelty in the short time they're around, you know, filtered very strongly into early liberalism, but by the Cold War, liberals were saying it's dangerous and it's a source of totalitarianism to think that way. Much better to think about freedom as private and the state as having no real role other than to you know keep itself from interfering with freedom in private. Um, and then lastly, there's something we've already touched on, which is that... Um, Liberals in the 19th century had adopted this kind of left wing Hegelian view against Fukuyama's later right wing Hegelian view that we the point of liberalism is to to bring about freedom and equality in time. We're part way there, but we're not, you know, even very far down the transition from a world of oppression to a world of liberation and liberals have to liberate in time and history and have a kind of sense of expectation about the future, which Cold War liberals relinquished. And this sort of um, emancipatory liberalism, it also had a very different relationship to something like Marxism than, you know, Cold War liberalism has with Marxism. I think that's true. I mean, it's only fair to note first that liberals helped invent socialism. Uh, there were lots of liberal socialists. John Stuart Mill, by the end of his life, was one. Marxism was explicitly hostile to liberalism, but the reverse wasn't true in every case. And especially in theory, uh, liberals, as the 19th century passed and industrial capitalism became so oppressive uh, and class hierarchy mounted, liberals basically began to accept that Marxism had part of the truth and committed themselves never enough, but to some, you know, greater and greater extent towards something like welfare state policy. And if we ask how it is in the 40s, when liberals in theory are inventing Cold War liberalism, liberals in practice are inventing welfare states, the most egalitarian liberal states before or since, then we have to credit the learning that liberals did 
in relation to Marxist criticisms of their ideas. And in a sense, liberal Marxism was created in the middle of the 20th century, but the Cold War liberals came about around and, and purge Marxism from liberalism and I think paved the way to neoliberalism. Going back to the, the issue of romanticism, I'll be honest, I've gone back and forth on uh, the idea of romanticism. And I've thought to myself at times, uh, you know, romanticism and irrationalism, this is the kind of thing that spurred on, you know, uh, mm. the German Nazis. Uh, but yeah. your book provides a, a little bit more nuance. Yeah. Well, I just don't think that's true. I mean, that is actually a story that comes to us thanks to Cold War liberalism. Um, and I try to show that uh, in talking about the writings of some other folks like Jacob Talmon, who um, really spent his life in dining Rousseau and Romanticism as the wellsprings of, uh, Romanis, uh, of, of totalitarianism. I mean, I think that what's really important to remember is that things like nationalism and revolution were liberal causes uh, in their origin. And the first, you know, nationalists who called for violent revolution, you know, anticipating something we think of as essential in the middle of the 20th century worldwide decolonization, were doing so for the sake of freedom, not oppression. Uh, and in that regard, I mean, I think you can, we need, we need to tell how it is that, you know, uh, 20th century totalitarianism, especially right-wing totalitarianism came about. I think there are a lot of other sources uh, that have to be added to this romantic legacy. One of course is this, on well, one would be the significance of race. Um, which is really kind of growing only in the late 19th century. And in a, in a sense, uh, in a kind of social Darwinist environment, added on to the earlier idea of nationalism, which had been about liberating not just individual people, but all the world's people. So just as an example, one of the founders of nationalism, a liberal named Giuseppe Mazzini, a, a, an Italian, um, dreamed not only of a free Italy, but a free Europe, free from the tyranny of empires and had massive influence on Mohandas Gandhi and many other decolonizers and did not think of the Italians as a race. Uh, they just were kind of a group that would provide a first, um, you know, organizational focus for universal emancipation and ultimately these national distinctions might melt away. Uh, and of course, that's not what Adolf Hitler thought because he's inherited an ethno-nationalism, a racialized nationalism that has in a sense, you know, in the spirit of social Darwinism treated, uh, you know, nationalism as something that involves competition of nations with one another, but that's the opposite of what Mazzini and you know earlier liberal nationalist belief same is true of revolution i mean if you're an american uh, or a frenchman you think of revolution violent revolution as a potentially emancipatory event uh it ends empires in the name of of national ascendancy and that was true through decolonization but in the cold war uh because the soviets kind of took ownership of the whole idea of revolution, Cold War liberals gave up on emancipation, including through, uh, you know, violent revolution. And so they had very little to say about decolonization of their own moment, even though, you know, it, they were living at the time of maybe the most emancipation, the most liberal emancipation that's ever occurred. It's interesting you mentioned that because uh, you talk about the silence of most of these figures when it came to decolonization. But there is one that you point out wasn't as silent. And uh, I'm not sure she, at the beginning of the chapter on her, uh, you indicate that she wouldn't define herself as a liberal, but we're talking about Hannah Arendt. Uh, how important was uh, writing about Hannah Arendt uh, to telling the story uh, that you're setting out to tell in this book? 
Well, you know, I, I would say, you know, not essential, but useful because even though she wasn't herself a cold war liberal and uh, I try to show that she was a fellow traveler, but you know, she's most useful as you have suggested because she, she's very critical of national emancipation around the world in the global South. Uh, and if we ask, you know, why are cold war liberals silent about those very facts, uh, then we, I think aren't in a sense helps give an answer, uh, precisely because she shared so much with them. And it's essentially that they have are liberals who've begun rejecting revolution and nationalism. And they, they, they have, let's say a racialized belief seemingly that, you know, uh, freedom is possible, liberal freedom in the global North, but not in, you know, across the then global color line in the global South. And this seems to me to be like the only, you know, way of understanding why the cold war liberals were so ungenerous to the spread of freedom that was occurring in their very own moment. And yet, which they said nothing about. It's sort of this Western chauvinism. And also yeah. I, I think a lot of these Cold War liberals would have had the view of, well, maybe something can be done for the global South, but only with the good paternalistic West uh, sort of guiding the way, uh, you know, sort of um, civilizing the savages sort of mentality. I think that's right. That later on in, in Cold War history, um, you know, a lot of Westerners kind of did take on neo-imperialistic views. And that's especially because they really felt they had to go out into the global South and, you know, help the natives to avoid their choice of communism instead. And so even as America, just for example, you know, killed millions in the Vietnam War before and during that, time, they were also thinking of kind of building a Vietnam that would be attractive through, you know, massive economic transformation. I think the early Cold War liberals I'm talking about in the book don't go there. They're kind of, you know, they're writing too early for seeing the, the third world as a scene of of kind of competition between the West and the communist East. Um, but and so I think that the argument about them has to be a little different, that they don't kind of see the world as eligible for freedom, either on a kind of old imperialist model or on a later imperialist model. They just give up uh, and think of the West um, facing communism as just like a refuge for freedom in a very difficult era. Since we hit upon a rent, I, I want to deal with the topic, and you, you cover it throughout the book at various points, but uh, the ways in which uh, Jewish intellectuals and you know this issue of Zionism uh, plays into the story of liberalism against itself, uh, mainly, I think, in the chapters on a rent and uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb. So, you know, like many historians of this crew, I, I just was struck by the fact that most of them are Jews or, you know, everyone in the book. Um, and then the natural question arises, why does that matter? Uh, and I think I'm trying to rebut a certain kind of ethnic stereotyping that's easy to fall into. Um, or, you know, among Jewish intellectuals lately, a kind of like search for roots and thinking that being Jewish gives you special, you know, capacities or, you know, unique ones, even perhaps because of tradition or perhaps because of the collective experience in the middle of the 20th century. But, you know, as far as I can tell, like Jews are all over the map in this period. They're also leading socialists and communists, uh, and they might have very different ideas about liberalism that their background or their experience doesn't teach. And so I use some of these figures like Arendt and Gertrude Himmelfarb, later a neoconservative, to kind of investigate what made these characters Jewish. And my conclusion is, is largely that it was the way in which they generally were willing to see Israel founded in 1948 as a place where 
you know, nationalist violent bids for collective emancipation were not just tolerable, but, you know, romantic and, you know, uplifting where everywhere else in the world, they were treated as kind of dangerous and tyrannical. And so this, I think, doesn't speak very well of them. I think uh, I say even in the book, I go so far as to say maybe, you know, whatever our views about Zionism in general, the trouble with these figures is that they weren't Zionists enough because they weren't willing to see other peoples than the Jews engaging in legitimate, uh, if you like, Hegelian campaigns for collective freedom and equality no There's matter sort their of race a hypocrisy in their thought in some basically ways. that's it very very well put i want to get into this issue of neoliberalism and how it connects to cold war liberalism i guess first though uh i i think anytime i i mention the term neoliberalism i will always have listeners that will say oh that's just a snarl word uh, sure. what does it mean so maybe you could talk about what neoliberalism is and its connection to cold Good. war liberalism going back to even you know, some of these figures ending up uh, speaking at the Mont Pelerin Society. Good. Uh, you know, it, we've on, undergone a journey lately because uh, just a few years ago, it was seen as somehow, you know, beyond the pale to even talk about neoliberalism. In fact, if, you know, our friend Jonathan Chait once wrote a very, you know, widely read column that tried to indict the very use of the term to describe developments in post-war history and especially the U S democratic party after Jimmy Carter. And yet now I think we can see that something big happened, which is that in the middle of the 20th century, uh, there was more of a consensus around building welfare states characterized by high, you know, high and progressive taxation, uh, and redistribution, through various mechanisms, you know, uh, some greater commitment to building not just social safety nets, which of course has sometimes continued uh, in like in the case of Obamacare, but also more class egalitarian societies. Uh, and what neoliberalism has generally been taken to mean is a kind of attack on that whole mid 20th century consensus and the tools that especially liberals and, you know, a broader crew of social Democrats deployed to create not just free, but fair societies, including in the non-communist West. And, um, you know, we could get into kind of some of the details, but neoliberalism has often been associ associated with market fundamentalism, the use of the state to spread markets. Um, Is it, the, would you say it's almost, I mean, I, I don't like to say that it's synonymous with libertarianism, but it has massive overlaps. I think it's economically libertarian, but, you know, I think we've learned that it's very comfortable with the use of state power to impose libertarian arrangements, especially on a global scale where institutions like the International Monetary Fund and World Bank were very coercive uh, when uh, you know, states around the world wanted to organize their economies differently or choose different macroeconomic policies like old school ones of the kind that, you know, America and Britain had had in the 40s. And so we shouldn't forget that there's an element to state power and not just a kind of like longing for the demolition of the state, which is, you know, becomes very associated with not just the Republican Party after Ronald Reagan, but the Democratic Party in calls for ending welfare as we know it. And, um, you know, the kind of collusion and the, the you know rise of class inequality since the 1970s. I was going to say, and some of these figures uh, become big supporters of sort of the Reagan revolution, like Gertrude, Gertrude Himmelfarb. And then also you have that sort of connection between, I believe it was Karl Popper and uh, Hayek, you know, right. the road to serfdom. So that connection is there very early on, it seems like, you know, with some of these figures becoming involved with the Mont Pelerin Society, which I would say is like the, the origins of neoliberalism right. in a lot of ways. Yeah, I try to make a couple of arguments about... Um kind of the road to neoliberalism and 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 that has to include the neoliberalism that ends up being part of neoconservatism which kind of overlaps with neoliberalism um so i'll just say maybe 
kind of three different arguments that are offered in the book in this regard. One is that there's just a lot of overlap between Cold War liberalism and neoliberalism. Both are about freedom against the state, and they're especially oriented to the totalitarian state, you know, which which Hayek claims uh, is going to be where any kind of plant planned economy um, or redistributive activity leads. Um, and then I suggest that, well, the, the, the fact is that some of the cold war liberals like Isaiah Berlin, uh, were, you know, critics of Hayek at least before and after the cold war very openly. And, they themselves were social Democrats, but their theories of freedom were libertarian. And so in a sense, their theories matched Hayek's uh, politics in a sense more than they did their own politics. And the suggestion is not that this, you know, single handedly brought about neoliberalism, but that it, there was not an intellectual defense of welfare states uh, chosen by Cold War liberals, much more a kind of common front with neoliberals against totalitarianism. And this was, I think, foolish. And then we get to figures like Himmelfarb, who, you know, begin their lives as Cold War liberals. And I just try to show that the form of liberalism that uh, she chose, you know, left her very close to her ultimate neoconservative um, destination in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, alongside her husband Irving, Irving Crystal, Crystal. And then Bill later, their kid, yeah. yeah, who's much more famous, Bill Bill Crystal later, and you know it, that's a very long story. But just briefly, you know, neoconservatism emerges as a domestic policy position, though we associate it with uh, foreign policy, rightly so, given the Iraq War and so forth. And the domestic policy position was basically. You know, we we need neoliberalism in the market and the way to kind of keep it working will be kind of Christian morality and families. And uh, Himmelfarb's thought is really about that crucial addition of Victorian moralism so that people think of themselves as responsible for their own fate uh, have, you know, don't rely on the handouts and welfare of the state to make their way, but also kind of, you know, live in families, which will guarantee kind of social stability in a world in which, you know, men especially are making their way in the kind of, you know, dog eat dog world of the free market. And so she's very important as just, uh, just one illustration of where neoliberalism could, sorry, where Cold War liberalism could lead and, you know, not just to neoconservatism, let's say on its own, sorry, neoliberalism on its own, but also this neoconservative movement of later, later years. It was very interesting to me reading the um, Himmelfarb chapter because uh, I, I had mentioned uh Lord Acton earlier figuring into the book, and that's because she's very influenced by him. And the only other time I've ever seen Lord Acton brought up is when I was in college and I knew some like, you know, kind of to me far out libertarian kids that were into von Mises style libertarian that loved it. That's all they would talk about is Lord Acton. It's just Absolutely. interesting how a lot of these figures end up having a lot of overlaps with uh, sort of the von Mises style libertarians and, and their interests. No, absolutely right. So, I mean, you know, Hayek w w was a disciple and student of von Mises and ends up, uh, you know, proposing first to call the, the Mont Pelerin Society the Acton Society. Um, and many libertarians since that time have taken Acton as who, who lived in the later 19th century. Uh, as a kind of, you know, guru. Now, the funny thing is that Himmelfarb, who wrote her dissertation on Acton, kind of revealed that he himself had trended socialist in his later life. And it was for that reason that she was pretty hostile to Hayek as a youth. But my claim is that, you know, by creating this form of liberalism that was no longer about hope, more about you know, Christian sin 
she was taking a lot of steps towards where she would end up all the same. And so that's why her early work on Acton is kind of interesting. It's interesting how uh, these different figures that that you sum up as the cool or liberals all yep. take uh, from different influences, whether it's from Lord Acton and his Christianity sure. or uh, Freud and psychoanalysis, but they all sort of gel together. They're using Absolutely. different influences to achieve their means. That's right. I mean, you know, my take is that one way of studying the history of ideas is through like what people say we should read and not read. And, you know, I'm taking an inspiration from like church historians who have reminded us like how big the battles over were over like what what were the canonical gospels and what got left on the cutting room floor. And I'm saying that, you know, we can interpret the history of liberalism that way. You know, if you grew up when, you know, we did in recent decades, you were started out on liberalism with John Locke, who wasn't even seen to be a liberal until the 20th century, and especially the Cold War. And meanwhile, the 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 earlier sources we talked about, like Rousseau and the French Revolution and Hegel were just dropped out of thinking about what liberalism was, even as people, you know, began to propose these new sources like Acton and Freud and all of the readings they make of these various, you know, books are pretty contestable. And yet it, I think we can see that it's exactly their use of these books to redefine what liberalism is and means for students and readers. Can you discuss a little bit, the ways in which some of these figures may have cre- created, uh, maybe this is too strong a word, but straw men. Uh, so, for instance, uh, when talking about the Enlightenment, you know, I, I'm not sure that their idea of the Enlightenment was what people talked about when the Enlightenment was uh, uh, right. used when they were alive. So, could you talk about that? No, I mean it's it's the absolutely. Well, they created they created very, um, you know dubious interpretations of everything they talked about. And yet they were enormously influential. And the trouble just, you know, is that later scholars can come and wonder how they could have been taken seriously. uh, And yet they were. And just as an example, there have been generations of scholars who tried to save Rousseau from the allegation that he founded either, you know, nationalism or communism. And yet uh, he was taught that way for generations because of the Cold War liberal, you know, straw manning. So, you know, insofar as these books matter at all, it seems like the uh, the 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 success they enjoy in setting up you know straw men is what matters and then we should care about our own time you know what very implausible interpretations uh, of anything books or non-books are being set up and yet they have an, an enormous effect or you know potentially big effect there were just a few more things i wanted to cover if you have the time uh, your chapter on Karl Popper is uh, rather fascinating to me because, you know, uh, Popper would talk about a lot about historicism. And that was the big thing yeah. that he attacked. And I, I mean, it's understandable on a certain level. I, I think that most people can look at history and say it's not deterministic, that history isn't, uh, you know, strictly deterministic. But yeah. I think you uh, make the argument that, well, that's one type of way of talking about historicism, but it doesn't have to be the most extreme version of it where it's, you know, strictly deterministic. Yeah. So I, you know, Popper is a fascinating case because as you know, we've already discussed, he ends up, you know, attending the Mont Pelerin society meeting. He's given a job essentially by Hayek at the London school of economics. Uh, and yet he begins a socialist uh, and uh, he, he makes some pretty credible arguments against the belief that, you know, some communists had and some liberals have had that uh, history is like a law like necessary process. And I think those arguments stand. Um, it's just that 
the way he made them and the the influence of his you know beef with Hegel and Marx led a lot of liberals to in a sense throw the baby out with the bathwater that you know we may need a sense of orientation and in, in history for emancipation we look back and we can see that people were more oppressed before than they are now and we look forward and we dream of a less oppressive world you know barack obama whatever you know else you can uh say about him kind of channeled this when he would famously invoke a kind of religious version of this from martin luther king that the arc of the moral universe is long but bends towards justice and you know that's I think that's something liberals need to believe. That doesn't mean there are laws that drive history forward, but they need to believe that the arc of the universe bends towards freedom and it's their, you know, obligation to bring them about. And so there needs to be some belief that, you know, there's a possibility of a better future for our children, grandchildren, our society as a whole. I think that's true. Um, But there's also kind of, I think something else, which is that, we have to believe in some kind of historical script that doesn't mean that everyone is playing their part but you know if we just think that history is one damn thing after another we're very unlikely to see emancipation as what's at stake and it's unfolding uh and so we do need to look back and say wow it's you know fukuyama was right in a sense that you know hegel saw that we had once been oppressed with one person in most societies if that free later more people became free with aristocracy and then democracy came but we've not even taken you know more than baby steps towards making democracy and universal freedom real and yet there's a there's something we're part of it's is it a plan it's something we could dream of seeing fulfilled which doesn't mean that you know, we're bereft of moral responsibility or that history is just working behind our backs, but it does mean we're part of something bigger across time. I I don't know if these were your exact words in the book, but I think something you said that was insightful was that in the sort of ferocity of Popper's attack on historicism, he sort of helps to turn liberalism into what amounts to an empty vessel. And I think in a lot of ways, we're living with the consequences of that. Could you comment on that? I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, liberals adopted a kind of fearful approach to enemies rather than a hopeful approach to their their own role in bringing more emancipation about than before. And, you know, I think we're living with in the kind of ruins of you know, a liberalism that called for emancipation along enlightenment lines and thought of history as it's, it's setting. And so, and now we're, we're sort of living in that moment where it's like what Margaret Thatcher said, right? There is no alternative, you know, that's sort of the accepted orthodoxy now. Well, that's right. And, you know, that was, you know, if, if John Chait permits it, a very neoliberal statement and, in a way, you know, after she fell from power, Fukuyama used, you know, belatedly resurrected these Hegelian ideas to say, we're there. There's no alternative because we're already free and equal, but that's absurd. Uh, and so we've kind of been complacent in accessing whatever resources are there are in these earlier liberal ideas and finding new ones to, you know, drive uh, freedom and equality to, to be more credible than they are today. We haven't talked much about Isaiah Berlin, but before wrapping up, I wanted to talk just a little bit about him. He's the the second figure you cover in this book, chapter two, Romanticism in the Highest Life. Uh, I think he's a very interesting figure, especially because he comes up with this idea of positive and negative liberty. Uh, could you speak a little bit about his inclusion in the book and his relevance? Well, so he is probably the most famous Cold War liberal thinker. uh, And so he had to be there. And he's most famous for a lecture he gives 
in 1958 called Two Concepts of Liberty. And it distinguishes between a more libertarian understanding of liberty defined this as is like freedom from and freedom to and away. Yeah, basically. And, you know, the state is relevant because in the first model, it's really freedom from the state that he's talking about, non-interference by government, uh, which to me has always sounded very neoliberal, very close to what Hayek wanted, even if, you know, Berlin might have permitted economic interference. Uh, and then there's positive freedom, which is this more kind of romantic re- freedom uh, involving self-realization. And so, um, you know, he's significant as kind of like, kind of most famously, you know, um, defending the kind of ne- libertarian understanding of liberalism that in a sense is very close to um the neoliberal libertarian world in which we're actually living. And so he matters. And I think in that regard, because he helps kind of, um, you know, break down the kind of mythology around the cold war liberals that they're that We really should just thank them for defending freedom against tyranny. I think they, in doing so, they made some grave errors that, you know, it, it, it kind of epitomize uh, the mistakes that a lot of more practically important people made in creating the world in which we've ended up. I don't know if you would agree with the way I'm framing this, but I feel like these sort of Cold War liberals, they never really went away. Cold War liberalism didn't go away so much as it evolved after the Cold War. And I think the heirs to that legacy, as you talk about in the book, are people like Ann Applebaum, for instance. Could you speak a little bit about how this sort of mindset evolved past the Cold War and some of the heirs to this legacy? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, you know, my lifetime really has been the era of the hegemony of Cold War liberalism, ironically, after the Cold War ended, too. Uh, I mean... I, I'd associate it most closely with the New Republic magazine for which Jonathan Chait once wrote, not coincidentally. And, you know, the the kind of lead ideology of the 1990s, you know, close to Fukuyama's views was that, you know, the Cold War liberals, by talking about freedom from, you know, um, it, its enemies uh, rather than building freedom through emancipating institutions, um, you know, I think won out really. And uh, you find that the legacies of that everywhere and the kind of rejection by the mainstream Democratic Party of Bernie Sanders, who purported to offer an emancipatory alternative, uh, liberal one, as well as a socialist one for America. And in kind of, you know, the foreign policy of neoconservatism, which became, you know, very close to what many liberals believed that, you know, liberals needed to be clear eyed and pursuing uh, the enemies of liberalism, whether those were communists. We needed to defend the West from the rest. The rest, but also the internal equivalent of the rest, which could be, you know, um, homegrown terrorists today or you know, woke activists or, you know, gender, you know, gender nonconformists. And so the the parade of enemies ended up endless and everywhere. And it just gave us a liberalism that's really about kind of threat patrolling and not about emancipation. So I don't want to contribute to any feud you may be having with uh, Jonathan Chait, but what of his criticisms uh, do, do you think he was misinterpreting you at all or misrepresenting you? I wasn't a big fan because I felt like what he was ultimately saying was, well, you know, some of us liberals have made mistakes, but everyone makes mistakes. What what for you was the, the criticisms that you'd like to push back on from his review? Well, you know, I have no beef with him. I haven't responded, to be perfectly honest. I don't think he read the book or that carefully. I mean, you know, he makes a major you know, gaffes about, you know, what it's about. Um, But I do think that he's very angry 
um, at some other things I say at the end of the book and in associated op-eds, um, because, you know, my basic worry since Donald Trump arose, um, has been that the, the resistance as we now call it would kind of adopt a cold war liberal strategy, not figure out what is making liberalism unpopular, not just in America, but around the world. Um, but find its enemies and root them out, you know, as if one final Cold War uh, and victory in it would bring the end of history. But that's not what liberals are supposed to think. They're supposed to think that we have to make liberalism appealing. Um, and, you know, there are probably mortal enemies of it. But, you know, the main problem is the appeal of liberalism as an emancipatory ideology. We and and if people reject that, then we've got many more problems than you know. Uh, I think John Chait realizes. I'm glad you pinpointed that um, that point because I think one of my primary concerns on this show is issues related to the national security state. And I think it's pretty unaccountable. And I, I think that's very much connected to this sort of Cold War liberal mindset of constantly needing to assess whatever the next threat is, rather than providing a, a vision that is maybe in contrast to those perceived threats. Yeah, no, I'm, well, I'm with you. I mean, I think it's um, it's as if, you know, especially in the war on terror, but not only liberals learn nothing from defining themselves against you know illiberals uh and embarking on these endless wars against them which really can't be won um i mean if you're concerned as i think some neoconservatives were at least understandably this part um with freedom around the world the way you advance it is not by you know by by you know treating you know, it is as a place to, you know, conquer and convert, uh, but as a place where liberalism needs to spread because it's appealing and freedom needs to be modeled not as an imperial ideology, but as one that, you know, emancipates uh, people around the world. And, you know, it's it's really just like the opposite of what Cold War liberals and their later versions have been uh hawking now you know the ukraine war has given their views a lot more credibility because you know vladimir putin invaded of his own accord and we can get into the hazy background of that choice but he's an enemy of the freedom of the ukrainians and there needs to be some response but that doesn't mean that you know we should let ann applebaum and other cold war liberals just pretend that they didn't support disastrous campaigns abroad. I mean, they've supported every I, I, American I was war. Say, not not to interrupt you, but my fear is what comes after Ukraine because I think what well, of course, what always happens is you know uh, a, a lot of these sort of Cold War liberal mindset types end up getting high on their own hubris, and uh, disaster follows. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, when you're high on your supply and you're just in favor of every war, then it becomes harder to, you know, believe that this any particular war, any particular situation is the one that, you know, the rest of liberals should back because you're for any anything and everything. Uh, and so I, in a way, I think, you know, if we're interested in why um, support for the Ukraine war has never been high in the global South. It's because, you know, the Cold War liberals in and neoconservatives in recent years just, you know, have have not been credible actors. And so when it comes time to say the sky is falling for freedom, nobody believes them in the same way they didn't believe the boy uh, who cried wolf. There's one or two more things, and I think I can combine this into one question that I wanted to ask you about. Sure. Uh, your book is is interesting to me because it follows on the heels of some other books that have been uh, critical of the sort of braining, I guess, uh, type of liberalism in the U.S. I'm thinking specifically of uh, Sarab Amari's Tyranny, Inc. book. Uh, yeah. And I know you're familiar with that book. I've seen other people mention those two books together. Uh, so it sounds like there's uh, 
a sort of critique of liberalism coming both from the right and the left. What do you think that entails and how should maybe uh, leftists or left-leaning liberals approach that? Well, so, I mean, my my uh, critique of liberalism is just very different than the so-called post-liberal rights critique of liberalism. Deneen was a member of that. Uh, I, I was and- going to say real quick, uh, I, I like how the epilogue, you specifically titled it, Why Cold War Liberalism Keeps Failing, rather than Why Liberalism Keeps Failing. I think that was an important oh, distinction. And I, it- I like that you point out that, you know, Deneen's best criticisms are actually about Cold War liberalism rather than just liberalism as a whole, but go on. Exactly. So, I mean, I think there's something to, you know, take from Deneen, but, you know, while rejecting the rest and, you know, conversely, there turns out there's a lot to take from, you know, aspects of the liberal tradition before the Cold War while rejecting, you know, many aspects of Cold War liberalism. But it's, you know, what what is... Uh, what is once you take that view, it turns out that some of these post liberals are, you know, saying some important things. And Amari is a great example because though his book, Tyranny Inc., is partly dedicated to Deneen, it's really almost um, entirely a kind of leftist critique of neoliberalism. It's very uh, material. Uh, it's very material. Based. It's about the workplace and about, you know, corporate power and about, you know, unequal, you know, a- ability to bargain, which could lead, you know, to kind of unionization uh, as a remedy. And, you know, he strategically or not dropped out the kind of like m- more Deninian aspects of post-liberalism, but in the virtue of this fact, he ends up very close to the kind of more discriminating uh, view that I advance and others advance that say, you know, we can continue with the progressive and left um, argument without throwing out, you know, freedom and emancipation of that modernity rightly promised as our fundamental goals. Yeah, I was going to say one of the most interesting things for me about the Amari book was opening it by talking about, you know, uh, corporations trying to force their employees to go to Trump rallies. So he's right. not he's not discriminating when it comes to how corporations can uh, private tyranny can affect you, whether you're left or right. Um, I, I, I since you mentioned the post liberalism thing, do you think that uh, this sort of post liberal right could pose a threat to Liberalism. I mean, even the kind of liberalism I think you and I would be more more sympathetic to, because I, I think they're trying to provide a vision that's different from, you know, this this sort of post Cold War liberalism, and they could be successful in that if we don't find sure. a different alternative. I agree. Um, you know, right now, uh, I think they're just a ragtag bunch of uh, intellectuals who, you know, are are breaking with conservative intellectualism of the past. But, you know, Amari, just to take that example and launching his book, decreed that the Republican Party is unsalvageable as a working class party. And if that's true, then, you know, maybe it's not that post-liberalism is so threatening practically. It's that it's got the wrong framework and is not kind of thinking hard about how to save the Democratic Party from cold war liberalism and neoliberalism that said of course anything could happen and you know the the reason i think that trump won once and could again is that there's a a, a such anger at where cold war liberalism and neoliberalism have left america that other options other possibilities are opening up. And of course, it would be foolish if you have any shred of concern for the future of liberalism to let that happen. And it's in that spirit that my book is written. I I was just going to add to that, too. I mean, it's interesting, too, because I know other people have said, oh, uh, Amari, Deneen, et cetera, are sort of a ragtag group. But a ragtag, a lot of movements or intellectual uh, lines of thought start out as sort of a ragtag bunch of people and grow. And I think this is also true uh, with the left. You know, I think, you know, I'm seeing more Zoomers getting interested in unions. So I think there's challenges from a lot of different angles 
that are coming uh, when it comes to the present current form of liberalism we live under. And, you know, we could see a comeback of a sort of emancipatory liberalism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's it's in the name of that that I've written the book and, and, you know, I've, it's not like these are new ideas. Some of them are, are, are old. That's the whole thesis of the book, but, you know, I think they're practically gaining traction in new ways uh, in progressive circles. You know, the Sanders candidacy, I think unlocked a lot of future possibilities just as Donald Trump did. So that means that, you know, there are new possibilities on, on the left as well as the right. Closing out, what are your your hopes for the future when it comes to this topic of liberalism and its legacy and, and where it goes from here? And what do you hope my listeners get out of this conversation and the book if they choose to read it? Well, you know, I, I think that if they've heard of the post-liberal right, they are entitled to know that there can be a different form of liberal progress than they've seen you know, at least coming from, you know, the the kind of Cold War liberal intellectuals who have so dominated really uh, public discourse in the past couple of generations. And so it seems as if they, you know, people ought to give the resources of liberalism a chance, but demand a new form of liberalism that is just very different from the kind they knew and of which they may rightly have some withering skepticism. Well, hey, Samuel Moyne, I want to thank you again for coming on Parallax Views. Uh, is there any way my listeners can keep up with your work? Are you on any of the social media? Uh, I'm on Twitter, you know, on now and then at, at Samuel Moyne. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you again, Samuel Moyne, for coming on Parallax Views. Thank you. Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Samuel Moyne and that you'll check out his book, Liberalism Against Itself, Cold War Intellectuals and the Making of Our Times. As always, if you appreciate the work here I do at Parallax Views, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. One more time, that's patreon.com slash Parallax Views. And with that being said, until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say don't do it. Just to prohibit. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others will be doing this like crazy. You know, you know, we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm I know of the great anxiety problem, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that. Uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff. It's a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.